or three, but there are tensors that have ranks strictly greater than that. So I don't know if you can get all the way up to m squared, but I know in all cases you can beat m squared, the, the max, the generic one. Yes? Well, that's <laughs> right. So you're, you're anticipating what I'm going to say next. This is going to, this really illustrates why to a geometer border rank is much more natural because you can restore parts of this fundamental theorem of linear algebra by moving to border rank. But it's by fiat. You just take the smallest algebraic variety that contains the tensors of rank at most r. And then, of course, it's an algebraic variety. OK, this, these first two equalities are unsalvageable. But this is salvageable. This, you get this uniqueness of decomposition. And you, you get some other nice things. So that's, that was the punchline. But I guess, uh, right, so let's just go to that. So let me. Um, change notation ever so slightly because we should be more symmetric about things. So let's think of f as a linear map from a star cross b star to c. So f is an element of a tensor b tensor c. And let's define, um, let's let sigma r0 be the set such that the rank of f is at most r. And let's let sigma r be the closure. Now, I just wrote the word closure, and you should ask closure under Euclidean closure taking limits, or closure under Zariski closure taking the zero set of polynomials, all polynomials that vanish on this thing. And the answer to your question is you get the same answer whether you take Euclidean closure or Zariski closure. So I just can write closure. And you can think of it however you like. And then um, the border rank of f is the smallest uh, r such that uh, f is in sigma r, just to repeat myself. And as I said, sigma r is an algebraic variety. This is the zero set of a collection of homogeneous polynomials. So, um, so now we have a way to prove lower bounds. We look for polynomials that vanish on this set sigma r that do not vanish on the tensor we care about such as matrix multiplication. You may call it whatever you want. Easier than what? No, no, no. The, 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 the obstacle to proving lower bounds is to finding such polynomials. Once you find them, it's very easy to test on matrix multiplication or any tensor. So the ob obstacle is, f well, I lied. The <laughs> actually, yeah, so, so there's two tasks. And in fact, in today's talk, the second task, testing on matrix multiplication, turned out to be the more difficult one. But we expect that that was just because we were being stupid, but we don't know. But <laughs> we found some polynomials in 2008, and it took us till 2011 to, to realize that they were useful for matrix multiplication. But that was maybe because we were, we were um, yeah. But let me just point out something in, so our previous example, Uh, let me write it as a tensor. Uh, it's something like A1 tensor B1 tensor C2 plus A1 tensor B2 tensor C. I, I, sorry, I used X, Y's, and Z's before, but this thing has um, border rank equal to 2 
and rank equal to three. And this is just rephrasing in tensor language the example I had on the board in a minute ago. Uh, but I need to do that. Do I know the degree of this variety? Uh, no, not even in simple cases. For si yeah, so, so you want to know about sigma 6 for C4 tensor, C4 tensor C4, for example. We do not know the degree of this. Actually, oh, asymptotically, no. No, no. Nothing. No, no, we know nothing. Nothing at all. Okay, well, there's some ridiculous bound you can do because, I mean, you could do a, something, but uh, as far as actually hunting for polynomials, actually what I'm more interested in is the lowest degree of a polynomial in the ideal of that thing. Because for practical purposes, that's what you're hunting for. And that I, that I know some lower bounds for, but uh, the actual lowest tends to be much higher than the lowest, the lower bound that I know after a certain point. So. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you so explicitly you 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 yeah. But before I do that um in, in fact when I write them down they're so simple it's embarrassing. But I have to say that um we found them we did not find them sort of simply we found them by a, a long hard road. And so I'm not going to make you suffer that whole road, but at least I want you to know the suffering that we went through to get there, because at the end, they look so easy, it's ridiculous. OK? Yeah? Yes? Of that size? Yes, it propagates just like that, yes. And in fact, that's, that simple observation is it is essential. There's even a more sophisticated version of that observation because the representation theory of the general linear group GLN tends to be independent of N. And that, I'll get to it, that turns out to be absolutely essential in this study for asymptotics. But let's not get ahead, uh, ahead of ourselves. I'm already ahead of myself. I'm, okay. So anyway, I have a, I have a sure. So, um, so this is a strategy for proving lower bounds for yeah. longer ranks. Yes. Now, uh, so I mean that strategy obviously works perfectly well for lower bounding for ranks as well. But is there any extra information that we can use about the degree to which the polynomial vanishes? Oh, you are way ahead of the game. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the difference between the difference between the difference between three halves and five halves. And the difference between two and three, no, nope, is exactly the exploitation of degree. But it's it's a surprising, it's surpri well, so first of all, intuitively, because matrix multiplication has a huge symmetry group, one expects its bordered rank to be lower than its rank just on um, general facts about orbit closures, okay? But you cannot prove it that way. I, I don't know how to prove it that way. And the actual way both proofs go is by taking advantage of an unexpected good luck that the polynomials I'm going to write down for you have high degree, but restricted to multiplication, somehow you can reduce them to polynomials of lower degree by some clever trick and, and that's what, and then, and then once you have polynomials of low degree, you can say something about rank uh, that would not be possible with polynomials of high degree. That was going to be like the last five minutes of the talk. Okay, I mean, the reason I asked was just because, um, you know, so you have this issue that for the rank, you know, it's not a variety. Right. And then, you know, one of the issues is that when you take the closure of the mm -hmm. set,
But I, I will exactly address your question later on. And, okay. and you, you've completely anticipated the proof of the difference between rank and border rank. I'm like, I'm, I'm impressed by you guys, yeah. So, but uh, let's move on. Now we've decided that we should look, uh, do a little geometry. So um, again, our goal is equations for this sigma r sitting inside the space of bilinear maps or space of tensors. And um, I, we want, hmm? oh, damn. I erased the zero. That means closure. Sorry about that. OK. Um, want a equation p vanishing on sigma r and p of mn not equal to 0, right? That's, that's the kind of goal. And then that would, Im that would say that the border rank of mn is greater than r. Right. So this is, and the reason I got involved in this business in the first place, I didn't know much about computer science or complexity or anything, is this sigma r is, is a, an example of something that has been studied in algebraic geometry for over 100 years, an uh, example of a secant variety. And so I want to at least get, state the general object and then we can use 100 years worth of theorems about this general object just applied to this particular one. So, so in general, so let's let x, and I'm going to, so at home I work in projective space, but I'm going to stay in vector space today. Uh, I, I hope that's easier for uh, the exposition, but if you, you want, I'll switch to projective space. So the only uh, disadvantage is when I say variety, I'm going to mean something a little bit more than just a zero set of a collection of polynomials. I'm going to ask for a zero set of a collection of homogeneous polynomials so this thing is scale invariant through the origin. And our case, x is going to be sigma 1, the rank 1 tensors, and v is going to be this ambient space of all tensors. And we define sigma r0 of x to be the union. I pick r distinct points of x, and I take their span. And I define sigma r of x to be the closure. And now we have a geometric interpretation, a geometric understanding of that first pathological example. So these are the points on an R secant line to X, and these are points on secant lines plus images. Well, if this is X, and here is our point A1 tensor B1 tensor C1. So this is the set of points that lie on some honest R secant plane to x. Well, if you have a curve in the plane and you have two points on the curve, this is called a secant line. And as we teach our calculus students, the limit of secant lines is, as you get closer and closer, is a, is a tangent line. And if this is the point a1 plus t a2, b1 plus t, b2, c1 plus t, c2, and we let t vary, then in the limit we get this point here that I wrote down over there that has showed up several times in this talk. This is a point on a tangent line that's not on an honest secant line. And the geometry of this is really what's going on for these exceptional Algorithms. Exactly. Uh, I mean something that is in here. Uh, right. Now, 
uh, here's the, oh, right. So in particular, um, there exists. I have yet to hear a stupid, sorry, I have yet to hear a stupid question today. W sorry, where? Yes, yes. And in fact, uh, what I'm going to mean shortly is modules of polynomials because we have something invariant under the action of a group. But for the moment, hmm? so if I choose coordinates and my tensor has entries, then the answer is yes. But I want to stay tuned. But I want to say, we, I want to use some mathematics from 100 years ago. There exists an effective way to compute the dimension of this thing uh, from, from, from elementary facts about geometry of x. Uh, this is called Terracini's lemma. It's 100 years old. And in particular, this is what gives rise to this, um, this m squared over 3 that I talked about. This is via Terracini's lemma. And in particular, um, sigma 7 for this C4 tensor C4 tensor C4 is equal to the whole space. So any bilinear map that eats a four vector, a second four vector, and spits out a third, anything has border rank at most seven. In particular, matrix multiplication does. So 100 years ago, we could have easily predicted at least the border rank version of Strassen's result, if not the rank one. So that is effective that problem is solved. And it's, again, the proof is differential geometric. You calculate the tangent space to your variety at r points, and you calculate the dimension of the span of those tangent spaces, and that gives you the dimension of sigma r, which is not trivial, but can be done for this particular x that we care about today. Hmm? Well, it depends how well you know x. So for example, the um, case of symmetric tensors, Terracini guessed the answer 100 years ago, and it took 80 years to prove that his guess was correct. So yes, you, you can guess the expected dimension quite easily. And you can also guess when the expectation is going to fail if you're a little bit more sophisticated. So for if I did not take all my tensors m by m by m, then the answer is not, not completely known, although there's a very precise conjecture as to, well, there's an expected dimension that's easy to compute, and that's obviously no, that's easy, easily known. And then there's a conjecture as to the list of which exceptions exist, and that that conjecture is less than 15 years old. It's this, uh, a f maybe also a consequence of the interest from matrix multiplication, because we didn't, we didn't look at that you know, until recently. And, but for the square case, it's, it's easier if it's m by m by m. And that, <laughs> to our embarrassment, that was done by Strassen. But you know, it, 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 you know it's OK. Uh, right. So let's, yeah. For any tensor in C4, tensor C4, tensor C4, you pick a random tensor, you pick a tensor randomly, then 
there will exist an exact expression with seven. There's a, there's a set of measure zero inside here where you need more than seven. Can I find that set of measure zero? Can I compute the decomposition? Yes. The, the answer, me personally, no. There are techniques, uh, and I don't know whether they can handle this case yet. The, the, it's, again, this, so people with a training in algebraic geometry who, in my personal, I'm not trained in algebraic geometry, so I'm saying this neutrally. I'm trained as a lowly differential geometer. Um, people with training in algebraic geometry, I think, are the best suited to study that question. And they started maybe two, three years ago uh, looking at this, and they've been inching their way up. And I don't know what the state of the art is at the moment, but I could find it out for you. I know who knows. Because if I find a polynomial equation for sigma r, that does n is non-zero on matrix multiplication, oh. I obtain a, a new lower bound for the border rank of matrix multiplication. Okay. All right. So um, now, in addition to this effective way, there is an, a in principle, but in practice, not so effective way to compute the equations for this in terms of the equations for x. Um, it's called multi-prolongation, and that's actually something coming from differential geometry. It is, can be implemented in very small situations, but it gets unwieldy very quickly. But what it is good for giving you is a priori information about uh, where to look for equations and lower bounds for the degrees of the equations and things like that. So it kind of peters out pretty quickly for giving you the correct answer completely, but it, it gives very nice qualitative information and it's quite useful. Okay? Right. So now let's go back to. Uh, not just any old x, but our particular x. And so we have um, a tensor. And so let's first, let's get equations for sigma 1, right? Just the rank 1 ones. That, we should be able to do that. Well, here's a, here's a, here's a really dumb trick. We could think of t as, a, we could forget that it's a bilinear map and just think of it as a linear map between these two vector spaces. And the rank of this linear map will bound the tensor rank of this tensor. And so the, um, so I have to say, in, among my friends, when we use the word minors, we mean determinant of minors. So if I forget to say determinant of minors again in this talk, just please forgive me. Anytime you hear the word minors, I really mean determinant of minors. I'll try and remember, though. So, um, you could, you, the, the determinant of the 2 by 2 minors of, let's call this one Ta, of Ta, Tb, Tc, give some equations for sigma 1. And in fact, they, they generate, they generate the ideal. Okay. So that was great. So let's do the same thing for sigma 2. We could look at the 3 by 3 minors of Ta, Tb, and Tc. And this gives some equations for sigma 2. And again, um, gives all. Now, for this particular case, I should say um, that if we have three factors, that's not such a difficult result. A computer can tell you the answer. If we have more than three factors, the result is only a year or two old, and it's due to Claudio, who's sitting in the back. So you may ask him about that. So you, you really do uh, one dimension against all others, 
Oh, no, 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 no. If you have four, you, you also have to do two on two. Sure. So you do all the matrices that you can without. Yeah. Um, but you don't need all of them. There's redundancy. Uh, I think, yeah, so I know for set theoretic equations, um, 1 and k minus 1 and 2 and k minus 2 are enough for set theoretic. For That's true in general. And so you only need to do 1 k minus 1 and 2 k minus 2 splits. You don't need to do any other splits. Right. Okay. So, um, right. So that's great. So let's look at sigma 3. Three, uh, sigma three, you do get so the four by four liners give well some, but not all. Okay, and you quickly run out of steam this trick, right? But it worked so great, right? So, so uh, the state. Right. Yes. But even, even uh, if your n is large, it will not. It will never give you all. Even for sigma three. So. So I don't. I mean, it's it's a little embarrassing because you know you have one good idea, and so you just kind of try to beat it to death. And so, let me say a general statement for those of you familiar with some things in algebraic geometry. This won't be used later in the talk, so don't worry. So in general, if you have an algebraic variety X, one way to look for equations of its secant variety. Well, now I really have to do this because of the, what, what I'm going to say next. Um, you look for vector bundles on projective space and a map between them such that x is contained in the zeros, the, the, um, the uh, rank locus, say, uh, the, the, the rank less than or equal to k locus of phi. And then um, sigma r of x will be contained in the rank less than we go to rk locus of phi. So if you don't know any algebraic geometry, don't worry about this. But the point is this has been used um, for quite some time. There's a long history. Modern history, like Mumford proved something nice using this, then Griffiths. Then um, there was work of Eisenbud, Cohen, and Stillman in this general setting. And the punchline, though, the takeaway point is, although this is algebraic geometry, this rank locus is again just this taking determinants of minors. It's not, it's just this old idea recycled in fancy dressing, okay? But of course you get more because you're, you have more freedom of, of vector bundles and stuff, right? So. Sorry? Yes. Exactly, yes. Yes, in more sophisticated ways, okay? And what I'm going to so I'm going to I'm going to tell you more. So I'm going to tell you something. So this is completely general for anything in algebraic geometry, and I'm going to say something that is less general than this, that will work in our situation, and works in a slightly larger context of varieties and variant under a group action, and that's going to be the winner. Um, so, so, so. For example, uh, if, uh, if you use two or basic changes, and uh, this is the example exactly. uh, that, that, that doesn't give anything. It doesn't, it doesn't generate something to realize. No, yeah. no, but that's uh, no. Okay, so um, R, Rx is invariant, in fact, in fact, homogeneous for the action of change. In fact, this is exactly what you were saying. The action of changes of bases. 
let me say it this way, G, which is the product of change of bases in my first, mate, first vector space, change of bases in the second, and change of bases in the third. Right? So I have these M by A by A, B by B, and C by C matrices um, that will leave the set of tensor rank 1 tensors invariant, and in fact it will leave the set of rank R invariant because it's just change of bases after all. So, so, the, so that means we should, don't look for individual polynomials, look for G modules of polynomials inside here. And now we can start introducing some tools from representation theory. You see, because a polynomial does not show up on its own, it shows up its entire orbit and the span of its orbit. If the polynomial vanishes on the variety, the span of its orbit must. And so we should look, we should chop this space up into irreducible modules for our group. And fortunately, this problem has, again, been solved in principle but not in practice. There's a known decomposition here, uh, but then it just gives it a name, the, the Kronecker coefficients. Sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry. This is, I, I meant to write that down, sorry. Homogeneous polynomials of, so I got all excited in degree D on A tensor B tensor C. Thanks. Sorry about that. Right. And um, so now, but here, let's just work in a general situation. So let's say X, well, let's not be completely general. Let's let X be um, uh, homogeneous. That is to say, I have a group that acts on this vector space. I decorate it with a lambda. Um, that's what we do in our business. Uh, this is the highest weight vector. It, so there's a lattice and a cone inside a lattice that indexes um, the irreducible representations for a reductive group. And in our case, the lattice is given by triples of partitions. And this V lambda, in our case, this V lambda is just this A tensor B tensor C, but I'm just giving it a, a fancier name. And G is the product of the general linear groups, and P is the product of three parabolic groups, uh, each of which preserves a line in the vector space. That's what stabilizes a point. So this P is the stabilizer of any old point. So this could be the stabilizer of say A1 tensor B1 tensor C1. Hmm? What? Oh, well, you see, okay, let me do this. I, I should be a little careful and I'm not, so. Oh, P for projective space. You see the varieties are invariant under rescaling and um, I'm trying to avoid discussion of projective space because it's not needed today, but it's notationally I'm um, being dishonest. Uh, so so I, I can erase that P if you'll forgive a slight notational dishonesty. You see, this way that thing is compact, and the other way it's, it's not, and I, it's better off to have something compact. Um, right, so, hmm? In the, so, again, if I work in projective space, I quotient by rescaling and throw out the origin, then my x, in this case, and all the sigma r's, are compact. Yes. Larger than what? Uh, can you get larger with the symmetry? Because 
Yes, but for the same trivial reason that you just said. Like, say I have C2 tensors, C2 tensors C100, then eventually this C2 tensor C2 might as well be a C4. So, and there's, so, and there's similar th situations. I don't know of any non-trivial way to do it, but I don't, I cannot, I, I don't know a proof that it doesn't happen non-trivially. But it, it certainly occurs trivially frequently, even before you get to full ambient space. Right, so, um, so the point is that the idea is look for uh, irreducible G modules, say V mu and V nu, such that V lambda sits inside the space of linear maps from the dual of V mu to V nu. Again, this is the same trick, on the same trick as here and as here, only in representation theory world. And um, then x will end up sitting inside sigma, some sigma k for v mu tensor v nu. In other words, x will sit inside the old-fashioned rank k matrices for some k. And so again, the determinant of the size r k plus 1 minors give equations for sigma r. I'm talking about a completely general method. I will show you exactly, and you don't need to understand a word of this to understand the answer in the particular case, but I don't know how you would have found it without doing something, you know. So, so again, you don't need, you, you can doze off for a few minutes if these words mean nothing to you. They'll be unnecessary shortly. But let me just finish this sentence. Uh, so the determinants of size RK plus 1 minors restricted to V lambda uh, give equations for sigma R. Right, exactly. And that is the what, why I left this space if they are not identically zero. <laughs> and that's, uh, yes, that that's, turns out to be really, uh, this yellow bit turns out to be the hardest part, at least for, for the case I want to talk about today. Right, so you want to do a balance, though, because you want to, Choose mu. So, so let's see what we want to do. We want to choose, ideally, we want mu and nu such that these vector spaces are gigantic, because then we could go taking determinants for a long time. But on the other hand, we want this k to be small. And so we have this tension between wanting these things to be big and wanting this thing to be small. Well, so I want to do this same silly trick here, but I ran out of juice doing it the naive way, okay? And so now I want to do it a more sophisticated way. I want to reduce question about tensors to questions about linear maps. Now, what you do in practice is you don't just look for one such, but you look for a bunch of them such that you, such that you get some equations from each of them and then 
the, the intersection of all those equations hopefully gives you enough. Just wait, and, and you won't need to know anything about G modules, okay? But I wanted to explain where what I'm about to write on the board comes from, and it comes from this. And you can choose to ignore this if you like, because it's, what I'm going to write down is very simple. You don't need to, to look at this. But if you want to know where it came from, that is not a rabbit out of the hat. It's a product of a systematic search, okay? I want to emphasize that. Because otherwise, it's embarrassingly simple. <laughs> but you know, it took it took thirty years, almost thirty years, since the last time. So, right. So, and like I said, we had these equations since two thousand and eight, but that we didn't know they were interesting until very recently. All right. So let's let's so now let's do our thing. Let's think of T as this linear map from B star to A tensor C, and we have the, it's, it's minors, right? So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beef it up but a little bit. I'm going to consider something silly, T tensor the identity map on the vector space A. So let's, so this is a map from B star tensor A to A tensor A tensor C, right? Now. This vector space, though, we should really study this two maps. There's a map to symmetric matrices, and there's a map to skew symmetric matrices. So maybe I should be a little careful here. So if I have a vector space V, um, tensor to the K, sitting inside here, I have sim K of V, which is the symmetric tensors. And I also have a vector space lambda K V, which is the skew symmetric tensors. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff in between here. But um, these two. Arbitrary k. So for k equals 2, there's nothing in between. For k equals 3, there's only one thing in between. And for k <laughs> larger, there's a lot. <laughs> right? OK. So this lambda 2 here is just skew symmetric matrices. And so I actually have two maps. And it turns out that this one term is more interesting. So let me call this T A lambda 1. And in fact, why not? Uh, take this a step further and look at T tensor the identity on lambda P A. And again, I had to get a map from B star tensor lambda P A to um, lambda P A tensor A tensor C. And again, this happens to split into two factors, S2 1 to the p minus 1a tensor c plus lambda p plus 1a tensor c. And again, it turns out that this, this second one to the totally skew is the better map. So let me call this one t a lambda p. I got ahead of myself. Let's go back over here. So if we um, look at this map, let's look at this T A lambda 1 of a rank 1 tensor. So let's say T is just some A tensor B tensor C rank 1. Then the image of this map is equal to what? Well. I'm always going to have little a wedge anything else in a tends to this little c. So this has dimension um, a minus 1. So if the border rank of t, hmm? Hmm? Yeah. No, underline a is the dimension of a. 
an ununderlined A is a vector in vector space A. Right, so, um, so this says that the minors, the determinants of minors of size R times A underline minus 1 plus 1 are equations for sigma R. No, well, so I need it. Remember, there's this K here that I need to compute. So in our case, this K was this number A minus 1. Because uh, rank 1 tensor gives rise to a rank A minus 1 linear map. And so a rank R tensor gives rise to a linear map of rank at most R times R times A minus 1. Okay. Now, it turns out that this is a reformulation of Strassen's equations. This was not how Strassen discovered his equations. I'll say more on that later if we're all still standing. He was uh, using this idea of he, expanding by, uh, by No. He, he, what Strassen did was Strassen was looking at the image of T of B star sitting inside A tensor C. And he said, well, if this tensor is of rank, so now let's make all A, B, C equal to M, okay, because that's essential. So his observation was that if this tensor had, if T had rank M, then this image would be either diagonalizable or a limit of diagonalizable matrices. And so if you look at the commutators, after making a choice of identification of A with C, if you look at the commutators, the commutators will all vanish. And that was Strassen's formulation. So he, what he did, and then he did a more sophisticated thing, was he looked at um, the rank of the commutator to get his higher order equations. So Strassen did not use this perspective. He used this perspective of commutators. Well, it's not equal, but it's equivalent. It's not equal because the degree of the equations that I'm describing here is much higher, in fact, double. Well, it starts out double and gets worse. Is higher than the degree of Strassen's equations here. So in that sense, they're worse than Strassen's equations, although their zero set is the same. Okay, they're less efficient. But sometimes less efficient is good because it generalizes. Well, that's what I started to do here. I tensored it with something more sophisticated, identity on the, of the, so this is the identity map from the p-skew tensors to the p-skew tensors. And then, though I do something more than just tensor it, I contract down, I don't look at the image it, where it sits just tensor with the identity, but I do a projection, and that projection is essential for getting the juice. I mean, otherwise you'd never find it in there. Right. So um, here, if, um, if T is a rank one tensor, the image of this T A lambda P is equal to A wedge lambda P A tensor little c. So it has dimension is equal to A minus 1 choose P. And so again, the minors, the determinants of minors of size R times A minus 1 choose P plus 1 
give potential equations for sigma r. That is, the, that is the most difficult step. It was possible up until September. Well, it was possible that some of them were identically zero until September. But now we're in November. Okay? And in fact, in March, the only way we proved that these equations were non-trivial was by simultaneously proving they did not vanish on matrix multiplication. Now, um, I, actually, I could tell you why it took us three years to get smart. You see, the, the best P is around the dimension of A over 2. That gives you the best bound. And so that's what we tried. And if you try that, you find that you get nothing better than Lichtig's bound or Strassen's bound for matrix multiplication for three by three matrices. So we are not here because it's just a polynomial that This is potential winners. Yeah, no, 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 but they are just the ones that describe what the vanish on the right. It's not that the polynomial We do not yet know whether they are polynomials I am looking First of all, you have to notice these are lots of polynomials, different set for different choices of P. Okay? So this is, this is one construction, but it gives many, many inequivalent modules of potential equations. But a priori, these things could be identically zero, all of them. Okay? Or they could be zero pretty darn quickly that they're not going to give anything more interesting than what we already know. What's the definition of triangle? Yes, uh, I'll tell you exactly that. So um, we have vector space, say, V and W as our space of matrices. And so sim D, this will, well, let's say I'm going to drop stars. So this is my space of homogeneous polynomials of degree D. But this is a module for the GLB cross GLW, okay? And I can decompose it. So pi will be a partition of D. And let's assume D and W are large vector spaces to avoid some trivialities. Um, partitions of index irreducible representations for the general linear group. And we have this remarkable decomposition of the space of polynomials with this decomposition, okay? And so pi equals this trivial partition this way, I get sim dv tensor sim dw, and if I take pi to be the tr other trivial sort of representation, I get lambda dv tensor lambda dw. And this space here, if you write it out in bases, this is the span of the d by d determinants of minors with respect to any choice of basis. Okay, and if you take different choice of basis, you get different polynomials, but the span will be exactly this vector space sitting inside the space of homogeneous polynomials. Right. So now we need to understand matrix multiplication a little bit better to prove the hard part. I mean, and, and actually, there's other things that work here to give potential equations. Like I said, all of them from this board you're not going to see again. I'll just hide it once and for all. So we had this long list of reduction from multilinear algebra to linear algebra. We don't know what's good. So at least I want to prove that this is good for you. So, but <laughs> I need a tensor to work with to show it doesn't vanish on at least one point. And so why not kill two birds with one stone and show it doesn't vanish in matrix multiplication? Right, so then we have to understand what matrix multiplication is a little bit better. So let's let U, V, and W all be Cn. And matrix multiplication, I want to think of this as a linear map from U tensor D star.
star cross V tensor W star to U tensor W star. That's what it is, right? It eats us, uh, well, it eats, uh, well, now let's think of them as different, P, Q, and R. Looks okay. And all it is is I contract this V star with this V. We have a canonical contraction map. That's matrix multiplication. But again, we should be a little bit more sophisticated and not break symmetry. So more invariantly, this is the identity map on U, tends to the identity map on V, tends to the identity map on W. So that sits inside U star tensor U, tensor V star tensor V tensor W star, tensor W, but then I have to rearrange these uh, to this order, U star, tensor V, tensor V star, tensor W. Remember, the duals are on this side, tensor W star, tensor U. And now, Since it's a completely God-given tensor, we can look at this map, MN wedge P. So this is a map from lambda P, U star tensor V. That's our A star. Cross um, tensor V tensor W star to lambda P plus 1 u star tensor v, tensor w star, tensor u, okay? Now, let's go back over to this board here, and let's observe that everything I did here to get this map is compatible with the action of the general linear groups. If I change bases, these maps do not change. Only the way they look changes. So in particular, this map, whatever it is, is a module map. Ma matrix multiplication is trivially invariant under GLU cross GLV cross GLW. So the first group we were looking at was CN squared cross GL endomorphisms of invertible maps of CN squared. And we had three of them, and now we look at invertible maps of Cn, and we have three of them. And whatever this map is, it's a module map, right? It maps modules for GLn cross GLn to cross GLn to modules for GLn cross GLn cross GLn, okay? Now, let's look at this. Here, we have W star sitting out, and here we have W star sitting out. Nothing possible can happen. There's only, there's one map from W to W, the identity map. So in fact, this factors is to some map psi p, tensor the identity of W, where psi p is a map from lambda p u star tensor v, tensor v, to lambda p plus 1 u star tensor v, tensor u, and this is a God-given map, and there's only one such map. It's algebraic geometers call it a Kazool type map. It's basically differentiation and exterior derivative. This is a, this is, this is a God-given map, but even if you didn't know that, you can decompose this side and decompose this side, and Schur's lemma says you can only have non-trivial maps between modules if the modules are the same. And you get a list on this side and a list on this side, and so there you have an upper bound for what the kernel is because you know certain things must be in the kernel. And then you want to know if what must be in the kernel is the only thing there. And we prove that. And we had an exact description of the kernel as a module. But <laughs> so this was our, our December preprint. But then you run into sort of this problem of asymptotic representation theory because Although we had an explicit description, we didn't know how to compute its dimension effectively as n went off to infinity. So that's why we had a preprint in December and we were starting to study free probability theory and all this asymptotic representation theory. 
And then um, we had a better idea. So, um, so for any given p and any reasonably small value of n, we went up to n equals 1,000 with friends with good computers, you can easily compute the dimension of the kernel. It's not difficult at all, but we want a result for all n. And um, so the trick, the trick is to work with a not such a, what a, a p that does not look good at first sight, uh, the trick to finish uh, is take a small p. Take p roughly, um, I think we took p equals n, something on the order of n. It might have been um, n plus or minus 1. It doesn't matter. And um, notice the optimal was n squared over 2. So it's, we're, we're giving up something. But then, and show this map, is injective. And let me, I, I, there's a few other things I want to say, so I don't want to go into the details of this proof, but let me just say an SL2 trick. So for those of you who do know representation theory, we thought of u as some sim n minus 1 of c2. This is sim n minus 1 of c2. And because we restrict it to some sub, oh, sorry, we thought of this as sim n minus 1 of c2. And this, we, we looked at the linear subspace in here, the Carton product, sim 2n minus 2 of c2. And we computed this map as an SL2 module map, restricted to this subspace. And that was easily seen to be injective. And that's what gave the result. And then you have to just argue that a generic projection, a generic choice of SL2 and Carton product will work for you. Um, so. Uh, that was how we finished that proof by taking a non-optimal p and doing this SL2 trick. Now, uh, but I want to give the idea of the proof of the other two results. The result, how do we go from rank to border rank and how um, one, how was able to write down that tensor where None of these equations vanish, so these equations are now known to be non-trivial. And so, uh, just to summarize what you did, because you're going to explain this, this just gave the polynomial module that just to the tenth degree, which you arrive that doesn't vanish on the Right. Right. But, but. One of the reasons. Yeah, but, but the, there was sort of, <laughs> there was sort of a dumb idea. <laughs> don't look for, don't be greedy, <laughs> just be satisfied with the number that, works, and then to prove for this number, you still have to use SL2. Yeah, There's some non-trivial. So, so, so if you take P equal to N and you plug in, that's what gives you this 2N squared minus N, because it's injective. You just follow through. It's immediate. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we were just being too greedy. We were trying to get 2n squared minus 2, which or 2n squared minus a constant that was just too greedy for, for this. Um, right. So uh, I don't want to run over because I've tired your patience. So let me just point out this. The minors of this are a much lower degree than the minors of this. So this is. And so, yeah, I'm just going to say a few words because I'd like to spend. <laughs> you may regret that. Yes, I may not be standing for long. Anyway, so let me, let me, okay, so the key is, so there's, there's two ingredients that go into the proofs of both remaining things. So let me um, remind you, Strawson's version, ori original version, was mo determinants of minors. So, so Strawson, you really have dimension of A is equal to 3. So let's take a basis, in fact, alpha, alpha 1, alpha 2, a basis of A star. And you have, and you assume T alpha, which sits inside B tensor C, 
that's, this is maximal rank. And so then you get an identification of B with C dual, and then you can look at T alpha 1 and T alpha 2 as endomorphisms of B. You could com co compute their commutator, and it's the determinants of minors of this are Strassen's equations. And there's, there's a lot to prove here, by the way. And Strassen proved it because I made all kinds of choices. And you have to prove that what you're doing is legitimate, is, is actually honest invariant equations, is not artifact of, um, of your choices. <coughs> and that, that is non-trivial. I mean, the, there's a lot of uh, work you need to do if you're not using representation theory, and he didn't. He, he did it all by hand. Um, so uh, what, what you can do for this general case, again, so let's assume dimension A is 2P plus 1. Again, Strassen is P equals 1. And again, let's do the same trick. We'll have alpha and then alpha 1 up to alpha 2p. We'll use alpha to get endomorphisms. But now we don't ha just have um, one matrix, but we have a whole bunch of matrix matrices like this. And if I just take the minor of any old one of them, that's exactly going to give me Strassen's equations back. So what you do is you form a gigantic matrix. Oh, alpha 1, oh god, alpha, alpha 2p. So you form this block matrix. And lo and behold, this factored map in the reduced setting, well, I'm saying two things at once. Let me just cut to the chase. It turns out the minors of certain size of this block matrix turn out to be a, a formulation of R equations and coordinates. I do not ha know how to prove directly that this is anything meaningful. And in fact, uh, it would be very nice to have a direct proof that this is actually something meaningful. I only know it's meaningful because of where it comes from. And then, um, yeah, then once you have this formulation, to find the explicit sequence of tensors, there's a standard trick of representation theory where you have a graded Lie algebra, in this case, general linear group. Grading is nothing other than entries on a specific above and below the diagonal. And you choose these specific tensors to be specific above and below diagonal matrices. You want them to hug the diagonal in just the right way, and then, you know, it's just a matter of a uh, little bit of gymnastics. And then you can write down explicit tensors that satisfy the equations all the way up to the 2n minus 1. Okay? So once, I, once you have this in hand, it's, it's just a playing around. It's not, not rocket science. For the rank bound, there's a geometric idea that comes in, which I'm sure is where your question came from. Let's, let's, be, um, let's look at a degree 2 polynomial. So the zero set of degree two polynomial on C3 can, cannot, oh gosh, let me, let me revert to my language because I'm tired, cannot contain three lines. So its zero set can contain two lines, but not three. It's degree two. And in general, on n minus 1, it cannot contain n choose 2 lines uh, if the lines are from vertices of coordinate simplex. I mean, it could contain some lines in special position, but if the lines are in general linear position, it cannot contain a general configuration of lines. And 
Now, the key to the rank bound was an analogous statement is true for polynomials of arbitrary small degree. Of course, if I had degree three here, it could contain three lines. And so you, if you have a polynomial of small degree, it cannot vanish on all points of all linear spaces of a generic configuration. Okay, I, you know, I work in the Grassmannian, so I actually phrase it in terms of Schubert varieties, but essentially that's the, that's the idea. And now, the fact that this polynomial here for matrix multiplication is of lower degree than expected um, is what enables you to have this low degree polynomial. And now, see the difference between rank and border rank. You know, at first I thought, rank, what good is that? I can't do anything with that. It's not. But the thing about rank is you actually have physical points. And these physical points must have some linear independence property because matrix multiplication has no kernel. And this is not me. This, is, this goes back, this was used by Blazer and used before Blazer by I don't know who. Um, I think Bauer was the first. You do this sort of divide and conquer. You take the first n squared, and then you say that your polynomial can't vanish on all of the configurations from these. And then you, you do a standard gymnastics trick in complexity theory. But the, the take home point is that this reduction to lower degree is what enables this rank result. And that's what Blazer used to. So it's not a generic reduction, it's not that you would always get one more than you get for the border rank. No, you know that's false because for most tensors, the rank equals the border rank. It's only because of this reduction because of no, the no, symmetry. All I, all I said, all I meant oh, all even for matrix. Philosophically, well, philosophically, I would bet you would get 11 n squared, but you're not guaranteed it. Um, well, let me say it this way. If it's any tensor, if it's any reduction to linear algebra, you'll get it. But um, I expect the linear algebra is going to poop out soon. Okay? All right, so I did want to talk about some open questions. But I have run over, so let me just state them quickly and then we'll talk about them afterwards.